My name is Peter Morgenstern. I'm a pediatric neurosurgeon for the Mount Sinai Health System. So children with cerebral palsy have um, spasticity, in, often in their arms and legs or sometimes in specific limbs. Um, and what that means is that the muscles are stiff. And so the baseline level of tone in the muscles is too tight. Um, some children uh, rely on that tightness for um, balance and what they perceive as strength, um, even though it does not directly affect muscle strength. So muscle power or strength is when the muscle is activated um, by the child um, to move. Um, spasticity is something we notice when an examiner actually moves the limb um, and we find that it feels too tight. So to treat spasticity, one, there are many medications, but in children who need surgery to manage their spasticity, we do something called a selective dorsal rhizotomy. Um, and a common misconception among parents is that the reduction in that muscle tone or reduction in spasticity that comes with dorsal rhizotomy is making the child weak. And what it's really doing is it's getting rid of that extra tone that is uh, limiting the child's movement and function and allowing their intrinsic muscle strength to take over. And so often this requires a fair amount of rehabilitation and strength training afterwards because we've uncovered a whole additional functional level for that child um, by doing the procedure and often functions that they have not used before. But the procedure itself does not make a child weaker. Um, it allows them to explore their, um, their underlying strength. So one of the things that's interesting about plagiocephaly is that it's extremely common um, and it's because a child's head is just so soft and moldable um, in those early weeks and months um, that just lying on the mattress alone flattens the skull. Um, it is true that a helmet will work better if initiated sooner, but another really important truth to remember is that so will conservative measures. And what I mean by that is repositioning the child to avoid pressure on the back of the head, um, sometimes physical therapy to strengthen the muscles of the neck and avoid any side preference that would create an asymmetry in the back of the head. Uh, and so all, bo both a helmet and conservative measures work better in the early months because the baby's head is more moldable and soft. That doesn't mean that a helmet needs to be used earlier. It means that however we intervene, we need to intervene earlier for the best outcome. What I typically recommend to parents is that we attempt those conservative measures for a few months to give the child a chance to make that correction on their own, and most will. Um, for the few who don't, we can attempt a helmet um, later on, six, nine months, and it can still be quite effective. Um, and I will say that in my experience, it's been quite rare to have to prescribe a helmet for plagiocephaly. So th this is a really common question, mostly for parents of athletes, um, because there is a lot of contact in childhood sports, particularly in sports like soccer, football, hockey, uh, field hockey, and a wide variety of others. Um, you do not have to lose consciousness to have a concussion. You know, there are a lot of euphemisms to describe childhood head injuries, you know, dings, stingers, or whatever other term a coach or a parent or others may use to describe a bump to the head. Um, but many children can have um, mild or even moderate or severe concussion symptoms without having lost consciousness on the field. And so it's really important as a parent because ultimately it comes down to you. The coach and the child, um, while everyone, everyone has the child's best interest in mind, um, my experience is that the only people who truly have the child's best interest in mind is the parents. And so um, being very aware of your child's mental status and awareness and personality um, is really critical. When, they, when you see a significant hit to the head on the field or anywhere else, you, know, you take them aside, you talk to them, you see how they're feeling. And in, in a lot of these more contact sports, we also have neuropsychologic testing that can be done on the sideline. But in early in those earlier years, you know, elementary school, middle school sports where kids can still get hit in the head, just being very attuned to your child's um, appearance and personality. If they seem a little dazed or dizzy or nauseous, those are symptoms of a concussion and they really should come off the field and only return when they're not symptomatic anymore. So this is 
incredibly common in children and adults, but we get lots of MRI scans in this modern era of very good accessibility to scanners and very high quality scans. And it's extremely common to find things that are not the cause of the problem. And more often than not, those in, quote, incidental findings are nothing more than incidental. Um, you know, some common things that I can think of off the top of my head include things like mild Chiari malformations in patients who don't have symptoms, arachnoid cysts, um, you know, developmental lesions, like little spots in the brain that may have been from a, um, a, a, an insult to the brain or an ischemic or decreased blood flow event around the time of birth. We all have these little anomalies in our brains and just because we have one doesn't mean it's the cause of the symptoms. An important thing to remember is that symptoms like headaches are extremely common in the population and so are these lesions. And so there's going to be overlap without causality. And it's important to have an expert, either a neurosurgeon or a neurologist or both to help you evaluate whether that lesion is something that's causing your symptoms. And, even, and, and if it's not causing your symptoms, whether it's something that needs to be addressed or followed.